uh, I would like to um, present Christy Monet uh, of the University of Chicago for today's talk. Uh, Christy will speak on the family state idiom in the 19th century. In my end 19th century Russian literature, contract versus affect. And uh, Christie's Sebesednik will be Alison Smith of the University of Toronto. Thank you. Uh, thank you to the Jordan Center 19B for having me. Um, I, I, I hope <laughs> this presentation won't be um, too far into the realm of political theory for most, uh, but uh, I, I'm, I, I'm sort of, I will, I will present um, sort of in that realm, sort of uh, hoping that the general population's um, sort of knowledge here of Russian imperial history and Russian family novels uh, will sort of uh, click with what I'm <laughs> with what I'm saying and make for good discussion afterwards. <laughs> okay, all right. So uh, this presentation really introduces material that is part of my broader research. Uh, the project, um, my dissertation, which is titled Political Imagination and Liberal Reform, Figuring the Family in 19th Century Russian Literature. Uh, so this research aims to reframe our view of Russia's liberal history by centering the imaginary rather than the functional aspects of institutional transformation during Imperial Russia's era of great reforms under Tsar Alexander II. So more specifically, I focus on the ways in which Russian authors of the period took debates around liberal reform as an opportunity to use the empire's uh, sort of symbolic institu institutionalization of the family as a tool of critique in their literary production over the course of this sort of half century that I'm looking at, which is rough, roughly the 1830s through the 1880s. And so by, uh, by, in my dissertation, by considering the writings of uh, Sergei Aksakov, Ivan Turgenev, and Nikolai Chernyshevsky, my research project highlights the ways in which Russia's 19th century political imaginary posited that any move toward a more liberal, liberal in the sense of freer, more autonomous uh, socio-political order necessarily involved not merely functional transformations, but also symbolic transformations of crucial socio-political institutions, such as the family. Um, this talk has been motiv motivated primarily uh, by what I perceive to be a sort of uh, gap I'm sorry, this dissertation uh, project has been motivated primarily by what I perceive to be a gap in the framing of existing scholarly literature on the history of Russian liberalism. So in this presentation, I will, uh, I will discuss sort of this motivation, this gap. Um, I will also discuss uh, some of the literature that I'm using to frame my intervention, this literature on the social imaginary. Um, I will sort of briefly go into uh, the family state idiom as other scholars have talked about it in Britain, in the kingdoms of Britain, France, and Germany. And then I'll uh, sort of briefly give some description of this uh, development of the family state idiom in, the, in Imperial Russia. And then finally end with uh, sort of my literary evidence uh, from the dissertation, which is a political interpretation, uh, a chapter on a political interpretation of uh, Ivan Turgenev's King Lear of the Steppes. Uh, so, my motivation uh, for this for this project, uh, my motivation is largely that conventional approaches to the history of Russian liberalism tend to sort of follow a number of uh, a number of sort of trends in political theory. Uh, uh, the history of Russian liberalism is a sort of retrospective in hindsight, and it's the Russian liberalism in the pre Russian liberalism in the imperial period is sort of seen as a sort of precursor. To, to communism or seen in the light of, of, of an event that is a precursor to, to communism. Um, in social intellectual history, studies of Russian liberalism usually focus on an individual thinker or reformer of this period. And across the social sciences, um, there is in general a focus on what I call a functional or hard aspects of, uh, of institutions and institutional transformation which includes things like uh, the creation of law codes, constitutions, parliaments, et cetera. Uh, in political theory, examinations of Russian pre-Soviet political thought virtually begin and end with Isaiah Berlin's uh, collected essays in Russian thinkers. Uh, Berlin's work shares with many other liberal thinkers uh, more, uh, some core concerns about constraints on authority and the nature of freedom. Although um, 
I suppose, as, as one theorist, uh, William Galston, puts it in his article on Berlin's heterodox liberalism, the latter's focus on the limits of permissible coercion and mandatory obedience as a central question of politics places Berlin squarely within a sort of classical liberal tradition. As a Cold War liberal, specifically, Berlin sought to rescue several 19th century Russian intellectuals, including Alexander Herzen and Ivan Turgenev, from being labeled as forerunners of modern communism by Stalinist uh, propaganda, uh, as he saw it. His approach to rescuing selected thinkers from Soviet appropriation involved addressing some big questions. Um, for example, was liberalism a really viable alternative to revolution? And if so, why did it display so little resistance to both reactionary and radical pressure? Moreover, given liberalism's apparent failure to combat both reaction and radicalism, was the Russian Revolution actually, actually the fault of Russia's liberal intelligentsia? Uh, Ivan Turgenev's life and works were, for Berlin, the epitome of the dilemma in which Russian liberals found themselves for most of the 19th century. Uh, in his lecture, Fathers and Children, Turgenev and the liberal predicament, Berlin approaches Turgenev by highlighting the latter's skepticism of both the radical revolution and conservative reaction, his admiration of Western political institutions, and his supposed turn to rationalism and education as the only way forward out of Imperial Russia's socio-political crisis. Uh, indeed, sometimes it is hard to tell the difference between Berlin's description of Turgenev's views and descriptions of his own philosophy. Uh, Berlin seems eager to emphasize that Turgenev once referred to himself as an old fashioned liberal in the English dynastic or constitutional sense, and that the Russian writer generally abhorred systems of absolutes and instead believed in reason, individual rights, and negative freedom. I suggest that Berlin's close identification with Turgenev, along with Berlin's very personal mission of saving Russian writers like Turgenev from Soviet revisionism, may well have worked to obscure some other possible readings of Turgenev that would find his liberal sense to be different from Berlin's in important ways. Uh, while Berlin is not alone in thinking of Turgenev as a skeptic who was uncertain or hesitant to offer totalizing solutions for society's ills, Berlin left unspecified the parameters of the sort of reason or education that he claims Turgenev offered as steps in a better, more liberal direction. Um, in fact, as I will discuss a bit at the end of this presentation, Turgenev's liberal sensibilities throughout Imperial Russia's era of great reforms were suffused with affective concerns as dramatized through stories about the place of the gentry family, that is not only the place of the rational individual in a changing society. Turgenev has been repeatedly described by other scholars and in particular other Russophone scholars as a person and a writer deeply interested in not only the individual and reason, but also entire social classes, as well as in the passions that did, and perhaps more importantly, did not motivate them to action. Uh, one contemporary scholar of Turgenev argues that the writer sought above all to find a way to combine reason and feeling. Another contemporary Turgenev scholar similarly highlights the writer's uh, novelistic dramatization of affective relations between um, classes of gentry, peasant, intellig and intelligentsia. And still another contemporary scholar and political theorist insists that Turgenev's liberalism is based on a love of the family. Um, so it's uh, interesting to me that Berlin reads Turgenev's works and finds uh, the Russian writer to be largely a legalistic liberal, to use a term inspired by the work of theorist Nancy Rosenblum. Uh, so these are just, uh, this is just an example of some of the studies uh, in intellectual history and social history I mean, these are all outstanding studies, of course. Uh, my only uh, point is that they all similarly focus on sort of individual biographies of influential actors working to establish sort of functional legal and parliamentary institutions. And this is still this sort of functional legalistic view of, of institutions. Um, and overall, and sort of the extant scholarly literature on Russian liberalism, uh, the overall focus is, uh, it remains on legalism and its functional aspects of institutionalization. Um, so basically my, my research project wants to reform, uh, reframe this discourse on Russian li li uh, liberalism. So instead of viewing it uh, as an eventual precursor to the Russian revolution, I like to view it more as a long jury response to the political imaginary of Russian absolutism. Um, 
I would also like to examine it from the point of view of, of a more collective or dialogic discourse among uh, groups in Russian society, mine being the literary intelligentsia, rather than examining examining it from a point of view of individual biographies or intellectual histories, um, just to give it a more uh, a synthesized kind of analysis or broader synthesized analysis. And I also focus on uh, sort of try to focus on local understandings of liberalism and uh, specifically imaginary aspects of, of its institutions, which include symbols, metaphors, and idioms. So why then talk about liberal politics from the point of view of social imaginaries? Um, yes, the vast majority of contemporary scholarly discourse, as I say, on liberalism assumes an equivalence between liberal values and functional, uh, you know, legalistic aspects of institutions on the one hand, on the one hand, so this is where we get something like liberal democracy as a necessary and repeated combination. And on the other hand, uh, these studies completely eschew attention to symbolic aspects of institutionalization of liberal values. Um, so uh, as Helena Rosenblatt notes in her recently published an influ influential survey of the lost history of liberalism, theorists of liberty from ancient progenitors to 19th century reformers have always been concerned with more than a rights focused social contract and its attendant functional institutions. Uh, so here she sort of just goes through from Rome up until right around 1815, different ways that uh, words related to liberty um, uh, developed uh, in different societies and that in the history of liberalism, um, it's, you know, started out, oh, started out uh, as liberalitas, which is a sort of generous behavior befitting freeborn persons. Um, and into the Renaissance period, uh, into the Renaissance period, it became more of a liberality, um, which was the sort of development of moral excellence among people of superior status. Uh, the Enlightenment period really shifted liberality more towards uh, reform and tolerance. Um, and uh, these remained sort of noble sentiments, but they also became more uh, a, a way of characterizing a gr groups, how groups of people thought or felt. Um, and importantly, liberal values are opposed to mercantile values uh, in the Enlightenment era as well. Uh, Rosenblatt says uh, in the, the American uh, Revolution is really the point at which liberality in the history of liberalism really turns away from these ideas of sort of cultivation and duty and more towards protection of rights um, and reason driven formation of constitutions. Um, but uh, after sort of the French Revolution and the Reign of Terror and then Napoleon's rule, uh, liberalism started to sort of turn back towards more moral a uh, more concern in addition to um, and for for the sake of constitutional concerns uh, as reason as self interest was thought to be also capable of course as turning into despotism so um, Benjamin Constant and Madame de Stal who wrote in the period uh, at, just after the fall of Napoleon in the 19th century uh, are credited with developing the ideas expounded upon in the principles of politics applicable to all governments, which is largely considered the foundational text of liberalism as a political theory or philosophy. Both Constant and de Staal recognize the necessity of both the constitutional functional institutions of liberalism, such as rule of law, primary rights, uh, and representative government, but they also recognized um, the necessity of uh, sort of imaginary symbolic institutionalizations of affects and values such as generosity, openness, compassion, and toleration. And it is attention to the effect of cultivation of liberal values within this sort of imaginary network of symbolic meaning that demands attentiveness to the workings of imaginaries vis-a-vis -vis liberalism. Uh, so in, in his imaginary institution of society, Cornelius Castoriadis takes direct issue with the dominant functional view of institutions, which suggests that the existence and characteristics of an institution can be explained and made perfectly com comprehensible by the function or role an institution plays with regard to the real needs of a society. He points out that while real acts and material products within a society are not always symbols and cannot be reduced to symbols, their existence and their functioning as institutions is always impossible outside of a particular symbolic network. 
um, Percastoriatis, both the functional and symbolic aspects of institutions are linked to one another in what he calls the imaginary of society. Uh, thus, he posits that societies do not understand the logic of their institutions solely or even primarily through functional interpretation, rather institutions being constituted within socially sanctioned symbolic networks have drawn their source from the social imaginary. Uh, put another way, any social institution will address not only the needs based in natural, biological, or material realities, but also the needs not fully addressed by reality, but associated with largely unconscious questions such as who are we and what are we to one another, or what are we lacking and what do we desire? Uh, Charles Taylor, another philosopher of the social imaginary, names the family as just this kind of social institution, uh, sort of some socially sanctioned, uh, a kind of socially sanctioned symbolic network of both functional and imaginary components. By his account, the family has remained as central to Western social imaginaries in the modern era as it was in pre-modern eras. And more significantly for this project, he explicitly links the evolution and understandings of the institution of the family to historic shifts away from monarchic polities and towards more egalitarian forms of polity, including the liberal polity. And I quote him here at length. Um, Political, political liberalism as a social movement that takes off in the 18th and 19th centuries and many of the same societies Taylor references is positioned directly in opposition to the schemes of hierarchical dependence that fueled the logic of political absolutism. On the one hand, functional components of liberalism needed to be institutionalized, including consent-based mechanisms of power wielding. Um, but on the other hand, in order to displace networks of absolute signs and significations enmeshed with, enmeshed with those functional mechanisms of dependence, liberalism's imaginary components needed to be institutionalized as well, um, including the cultivation of new uh, moral affects and civic, civic sentiments. Uh, if, if liberal social critics had asked themselves, uh, what are we lacking and answered liberty or autonomy, then the family ever central to social imaginaries could no longer be imagined as a site of functional and, uh, and symbolic schemes of dependence based on absolutist terms of hierarchy and obedience. It had to be imagined otherwise if it was to find a place as an institution embedded in a modern liberal imaginary. Yet, as Nancy Rosenblum has pointed out, modern li liberal imaginaries seem uh, to center functionless views of liberal institutional aims and transformations with this emphasis resulting in the family largely falling out of liberal conceptions of politics. Referring to this kind of liberalism as legal liberalism, Rosenblum uh, observes the ways in which modern liberal imaginaries view society from the point of view of formal rules and procedures that function to, secu to secure order and prevent any kind of tyranny from impeding the freedom of rights bearing individuals. In, in an ironic way, however, Liberal, uh, liberalism sort of originary political dilemma of dissenting from obedience to highly personal rule in an absolutist regime has moved towards an acceptance of obedience to extremely impersonal rules. And that is only the public side of things. On the private side, um, uh, whether things are perceived as sort of internal phenomena such as sentiment, feeling or aesthetics, or perceived as interior spaces, relations uh, within the family, uh, these things have been treated by liberal legalists as largely non-political. This is due to the fact that the private and the modern legalistic liberary, uh, liberal imaginary is associated with the personal, the particular and arbitrary kinds of order. While this negative uh, view of, of liberty drives liberal legalism and its foregrounding of law, order, contractual rights, uh, such uh, a view that Isaiah Berlin held. Um, Rosen, Rosenblum points out uh, or points to a sort of chastened romanticism that could provide another approach to liberalism and help political theorists to confront and reconstruct liberal thought in a way that mitigates its political erasure of spheres, spheres uh, important spheres uh, like the family. While contemporary liberalism is currently preoccupied with real institutions, this is uh, no reason to suggest that it must continue to exclude the personal or the effective from its political imaginary. Uh, 
um, for there's a risk in overlooking the ways in which inattention to the political importance of affective sensibi sensibilities, i.e. not just a rational interest, hampers our ability to cope with important varieties of difference. Uh, and so uh, as, as contemporary theorist Kenan Ferguson points out, we must also be attuned to the very real problem of incommensurability. Um, might the inability of, liberal, of a liberal political theory to find a place for the family symbolize a huge lack in the former's ability to address the political at its core? For according to Ferguson, it is in families where we, one, experience authoritative demands that are absent legal authority, two, navigate structure, order, and creativity or disruption, and three, affectively negotiate between identity and difference. So for my research project, late imperial Russia is really uh, an extremely interesting case of a society turning to theoretical consideration of the family in order to navigate acute political crisis surrounding a period of liberalizing reform. Castoriadis posits that the 19th century and specifically the 1830s and 1860s is the historical moment in which Russia becomes an autonomous society in the sense that he uses the term, uh, i.e. a society consciously alienated from its own institutions and engaging in, its, in, in engaging in critique of those very same institutions. This is, of course, also the moment in which Imperial Russia first instituted widespread reforms, specifically meant to liberalize society to some extent. So the hypothesis in my research is that Russia's reconsideration and critique of the family as it had served as an institution in the imperial political imaginary, not only played a central role in uh, this experience of liberalization, but also led to different critiques and reconfigurations of the family than those that emerged from similar experiences with liberalizations in other European kingdoms uh, and empires. So for the remainder of this presentation, I'm going to offer a very brief survey of the family state idiom in uh, British, French, and German polities of the 17th through 19th centuries, um, and the ways in which confrontation with liberal ideas transformed the image of family in those societies' political imaginaries. Uh, I will then give a very brief context of the same process in the 19th century uh, uh, of Imperial Russia. And uh, finally, I will present a part of my political reading of Turgenev's King Lear of the Steppes, which I provide as a sample of interpretive evidence that I use in the dissertation to support my research's claims. <clears throat> um, so the societies of England, France, and Germany wrestled with the question of liberality since their Renaissance and Enlightenment eras. And in the face of rule by absolutist monarchs, their separate but related encounters with ideas of liberality all engaged with what I refer to as the family state idiom. This is a figurative expression of the principle of state power as viewed through allegorical, analogous, or metaphorical, i.e. all symbolic, relations of the state to the family. <clears throat> um, so I wish here to highlight just a couple of uh, very contemporary studies in English history and comparative literature that treat the issue of the family state idiom in great detail as it pertains to Britain, France, and Germany and their liberalizing moments. Um, so scholars like Victoria Kahn and Su Fang Ying show that Hobbes and his formulation of a contractual absolutism rejects the version, the sort of dominant version that existed up to that point um, of the domestic an analogy um, based specifically on affection and obligation. In Hobbes's time, family and the household were widely regarded as a microcosm of the commonwealth. However, the war wars of reformation sunk Europe into a time of chronic warfare that divided states, communities, and families, and brought into question the very possibility of uh, the sort of uh, liberal uh, common good uh, or common good based in liberality. Uh, Hobbes challenged these prevailing notions of the relationship between the family, uh, the familial and the political, and the private and the public. Um, uh, he rejected the popular domestic analogy that was used to naturalize the political order in his England. Uh, where this conception of a family as a microcosm of the commonwealth was used as a way of both naturalizing allegiance and legislating the affections, as Victoria Kahn puts it, Hobbes, Hobbes believed political order depended on the emotion of fear alone. Hobbes saw fear of violence as animating reason and reason as motivating contract. Uh, the theories of Hobbes and, and later John Locke were both 
a sort of uh, in opposition to Robert Filmer's patriarchal concept of family model state power. Um, Hobbes, uh, Hobbes and Locke saw the sort of patriarchal model as rule acquired by force. Um, and so Locke is really actually in agreement with Hobbes against Filmer in the belief that some idea of contract must stand above force, um, serving as a sort of the basis of political rule that is capable of holding together and resolving antagonisms between uh, individuals. The major difference between Hobbes and Locke uh, regarding the theories of the family is that Hobbes believes parental authority is based on consent, while Locke believed parental authority was based on contract, uh, which are have uh, nuanced differences. But both view the family as a sort of non-political or private pre-political sphere. Um, later in the 18th, <clears throat> Uh, later, 18th century political theorists such as Edmund Burke, Mary Wollstonecraft, and Adam Ferguson seem to dissent from these views of Hobbes and Locke. Ferguson saw liberality as a habit of soul by which we imagine ourselves as but part of some beloved community. And Wollstonecraft wrote, a man has been termed a microcosm, and every family might also be called a state. All three viewed family not so much as a retreat from the political and the public, but as a resting place in which the affective and ethical dimensions of public life were cultivated. Of course, the Lockean view of private families built on contractual relations largely came to dominate the British liberal imaginary. Um, so in France, uh, uh, Rousseau, unlike Hobbes and Locke, felt that the family was in symbiotic relationship with the state and that one should direct, and that the state should um, well, or one should direct the natural affections of domestic life toward the inculcation and practice of moral and civic virtues. Um, like Wollstonecraft, Rousseau also drew direct analogy between the family and the state. Unlike his fellow contract theories, and much like Adam Ferguson, Rousseau points to the importance of emotional investment in politics, his contract having a much more collectivist impetus than Locke's. However, both Rousseau's family and his state remain hierarchical contractual communities as they were in Locke. So it's not surprising then, as Lynn Hunt shows in her seminal work on the family romance of the French Revolution, that France's opposition to absolutism uh, took on a specifically anti-patriarchal character. Hunt reveals that politics in the revolutionary period were experienced through a frame which Freud would call a family romance a child's fantasy of being freed from their partially emotionally unavailable family and joining a better family of higher social standing. Thus much of the rhetoric and symbolism around the revolution involved dethroning the tyrannical father and instituting uh, a fraternity or brotherhood of liberty. Following the reign of terror and later uh, the end of the Napoleonic Wars, the family was rehabilitated and reconstituted in France's imaginary. It was no longer patriarchal, but paternal rights had been restored in most of the symbolic media and rituals of the period. By 1795, the father had returned as nurturing rather than tyrannical, and the father's daughter was dutiful and, interven and intervening in conflicts between men. Mothers were restricted to the domestic, though motherhood was much more highly valued than it had been before. The return of parental rights in the French imaginary were reflected in Constant's work on the French constitution in 1815. <clears throat> According to Constant, it was not to whom you granted political authority that counted, but how much authority you granted, whether held by the people or the prince, um, pe power had to be shared and balanced. And this required a cultivation of civic sentiments in support of the virtue of self-sacrifice. <clears throat> in that same year, Reactionary absolutist regimes across Europe were spearheading an outcry against liberalism, a term newly coined in this decade and used to denote movements against absolutism. After defeating Napoleon, the empires of Austria, Prussia, and Russia joined in the Holy Alliance to condemn what they saw as the effects of the French Revolution and to paint liberalism as a moral plague sweeping Europe. Reactionaries accused liberals of trying to destroy religion, monarchy, and the family, since, as Rosenblatt reveals, these absolutist regimes insisted that stability of the state dependent on hierarchy in the family, starting with the husband's superior authority over the wife. Liberals defended themselves by defining liberal political ideal 
ideas as those that were directed toward the public good and not toward the particular good of an individual or a class or liberal political ideas as promoting generous, elevated patriotic sentiments and not vanity, cupidity, and weakness. Uh, patriotic sentiments, including self-sacrifice is a notion we will see again in Ivan Turgenev's liberalism. Um, and finally, um, this is actually the case that I know the least about and I'm still working on. <clears throat> Most interestingly, uh, Adrian Daub's work of comparative literature entitled, entitled The Dynastic Imagination, Family and Modernity in 19th Century Ger Germany was just published at the end of January this year and I'm sort of still going through it. <clears throat> However, there are two immediate claims that Daub makes about Imperial Germany that to me ring true for Imperial Russia as well. One, Imperial imagination had been sort of uh, uh, a symbolic relationship structured through heredity, uh, at least for, for some uh, stretch of time. And two, imperial repression had led the German, um, had led to German politics relocating into the domestic sphere and in the intimate setting of the family. And, and there I'm actually thinking of something like John, John Randolph's work on Beck, uh, on, on Beck in the Garden. Um, but also, interestingly, uh, Daub speaks of German romantics as um, rejecting the kind of familiar hierarchy uh, that had sort of been established since Hobbes and Locke. And they insisted on sort of more horizontal forms of family as models for politics uh, that didn't sort of endow the community with natural authority. And this is uh, sort of really important for me uh, when thinking about um, sort of what, uh, what uh, Russian thinkers might have been doing at the same time with that, with that family state idiom and whether they were also thinking in more horizontal forms as well. Um, but in any event, Imperial Russia, Imperial Russia's sort of um, uh, re-examination of the family state idiom during the 19th century uh, era reforms strikes me as a sort of far more uh, far more akin to Germany's experience um, as much as I know about it right now than it does to England's or France. So my dissertation obviously focuses on the case of Imperial Russia and sort of symbolic aspects of Russian liberalism's critique of the absolutist imaginary, uh, especially in regard to the family. So some of the sort of absolutist um, absolutist aspects of, of, of Imperial Russia's imaginary uh, that I focus on are one, the state as a composite kinship, <clears throat> political bond as love for the czar and fatherland, um, and vertical models of social organization. In terms of the state as family, um, I sort of uh, lean here on uh, Janowski, Janowski's definition of patriotism, uh, which was, uh, well, this whole set, this whole uh, set of, uh, uh, this, of a, I think it's a three volume dictionary, was con commissioned by the Russian Academy of Sciences near the turn of the 19th century. <clears throat> uh, in it, Yanovsky defi Yanovsky defines patriotism as love for the fatherland, the feeling aroused in one to love and serve the fatherland. And he further defines within this definition, the fatherland as a body constituted from many families that together form one in the same political family or maybe familial uh, power um, of which the sovereign is and ought to be father. Now we can see some similarities between Yanovsky's family state metaphor and Rousseau's earlier likening of the family to a small fatherland because both use the familial idiom to discuss patriotism and both foreground the affect of love owed to the state or sovereign. But the relation of the family to the state seems a little different in Yanovsky's use. The household family is not a microcosm of the fatherland, rather it is an indistinguishable part of the fatherland, which itself is a large family. Um, Russian writers and intellectuals had to have been aware of this understanding of the state uh, and the imperial imaginary in the imperial imaginary, or at least I suggest, Ivan Turgenev, um, whose work I will give a brief interpretation of in the final section of this presentation, is 
quoted here in his unfinished essay on the nobility um, in 1858 as saying Russia was not articulated, rather it was uh, visualized pres uh, as a state expanded or broadened out into a familial body politic. There were no separate links within it. Um, in terms of political bond is affect and this absolute is imaginary. Um, yes, there are several works that sort of touch on this um, in an edited volume by Ingrid Sherla and Alexei Miller on historical semantics of the imperial period. Sherla focuses on Catherine II's era specifically and argues that politics and emotions were deliberately combined in the 18th century. Um, public festive celebrations, um, were sort of enacted, uh, were actually put on or to enact the ties between rulers and subjects and are very often marked by communal semantics of the family. This was meant to sort of compensate populations for their lack of participation and power sharing. Um, the sort of purpose of this political emotion, emotional concept was on the one hand to link tr a traditional loci, well, link a traditional locus of emotion, the family with the polity and to project family's ties onto the state. But it was also sort of pointedly to make nobility's duty to serve the sovereign a personal or moral obligation. Um, in Wartman's scenarios of power, um, uh, Wartman shows that the political, emotional and familial imperial dynamic of political rule didn't start and necessarily start with uh, Catherine's late 18th century or in with her from Peter the Great and Catherine the second to Nicholas the first and Alexander the second natural law understandings of contract assumed meaning through symbolic ceremonies of consent as submission. Um, that is the showing or feel the showing um, a, a feeling or sharing of certain sentiments such as submission was taken as a kind of consent. Uh, further, Nicholas I claimed that Western constitutional institutions were alien to the Russian people and that the sovereign was loved not for his ethnic character or divine right, but because he loved the nation as his child. And finally, in the Interpreting Emotions uh, uh, volume, um, uh, Sunni in his chapter echoes Wortman in saying that Imperial Russia grappled with, with sort of the particularity of nationalism and the universalism and enlightenment at the same time, and that Nicholas I's official nationality had at its heart the image of Russia as a single family, keeping old, an old regime image of the political community that revolved around the ruler and the state. <clears throat> um, so Turgenev here actually and his definition of what he thought it meant to be liberal rejects this imperial imaginary um, a, a political bond as affect or the way that it's framed in, in the absolutist, absolutist imaginary. So he makes the family state idiom revolve around the Narod uh, or the majority of the Russian people who were formerly enserfed. Um, so it does not mean, you know, patriotism does not mean love for the fam uh, fatherland. Um, and sort of serving the fatherland that is the czar or the sovereign, but it actually meant a love most of all for the people um, who were still oppressed by their lack of rights under serfdom and needed the active help of Russia's more fortunate sons um, to sort of break free of that. Um, so that's, uh, that's a sort of interesting turn uh, that Turgenev takes. Um, Finally, uh, in terms of the socio-political organization as vertical, um, the gentry estate was in general a theater of, that served a particular purpose in the, in the monarchy's imagination um, of sort of enlightened Russia. Uh, but how could service to the monarch as a landowner advance progress in any liberal way? Um, the purpose that, that these estates serve, uh, I think, is nicely illustrated by this uh, sort of painting uh, by Kust Kustodiev in 1907, entitled Emancipation of the Serfs or the Reading of the Manifesto. And it's just, uh, it is a gentry estate at its own kind of particular theater. And the nobleman is sort of reading or having read um, down to his 
serfs on his estate, the, the czar's uh, manifesto. So he's acting as this sort of in a, intermediary um, between uh, the sovereign and, and the people. Um, am I? Okay. So Turgenev's entire catalog of novels focuses on the nobility as superfluous and its impediments to acting um, for any idea of the common good. Um, nobles, uh, as Wortman suggests, suffered from a moral debility and that they benefited from the very institutions they found to be unjust. Um, and this contributes to what Castoriadis would call the sort of moment of autonomy where one is sort of alienated from one's own institutions um, and, and urged to critique them. So how did Turgenev, a self-proclaimed pro proclaimed liberal, wrestle with this problem uh, during the reform era? Like Constant, his solution, uh, in my opinion, seems to uh, have involved an ethic of sacrifice. But how could one convince the privileged without force to give up their benefits and to sacrifice for the common good. Institutional change had to start first in the family via the cultivation of certain affects. Um, right. Uh, and again, just to emphasize that this is not kind of alone, I believe, who's thinking about this. Um, okay, so I'm going to give a very brief and truncated version of uh, chapter three of my dissertation, just a, a sort of overview of the political interpretation that I put onto King Lear of the Steps with this sort of reading of liberalism and Russian liberalism in mind. Uh, Stepnoy Karol Lir uh, was published uh, in 1870. And I think it's interesting to note that the cover chosen here is the 1872 painting, Zimstvo Obiedayet by Grigory Masoyedov. Uh, so this is a very, um, sort of hard, one of these hard institutions um, that are produced in this, in this um, sort of legalistic hard institutions produced in this era. Um, so in any, in any event, to summarize the plot of, of Stepnoy Karolir, um, the narrator in Turgenev's King Lear recalls to his classmates memories he has growing up on the country estate of his mother the wealthy landowner Natalia Nikolaevna. In particular, he tells the story of his mother's favorite neighbor, another landowner and a colossus of a man named Martin Petrovich Harlov. This Harlov has two daughters, and one day, after having grown increasingly afraid of death, Harlov, dec Harlov decides that he will divide his estate between his daughters, Anna the elder and Yevlampia the younger. He gathers the relevant officials, and amid much pomp and circumstance, he hands control of the estate over to his daughters and Anna's husband, Slotkin. Some months after the ceremony, however, it is discovered by Natalia Nikolaevna that Harlov has been all but pushed out of his own estate by Slotkin and, his, and, and Harlov's daughters. Further, Yevlampia has refused to marry the suitor arranged for her by Natalia Nikolaevna and has instead begun an affair with her sister's husband, Slotkin. Harlov eventually loses his mind, over his daughter's betrayals and returns to their estate, <clears throat> the one to which he had left, the one that he had left to them, uh, determined to destroy the home out of which he had been cast. In the midst of tearing off the roof of their home with his bare hands, Harlov falls from the roof and dies, although not before Yevlampia has a chance to beg him for forgiveness. Harlov dies before he can fully respond to Yevlampia with either a pardon or a curse. Um, he is buried, and at the funeral, neither, neither Anna nor Yevlampia uh, shows much remorse. As peasants from around the estate judge Slotkin and the daughters harshly for the wrong they are perceived to have done their own father, Harlov. Years later, uh, the narrator runs into each daughter on separate occasions. The eldest daughter, Anna, has remained on the Harlov estate and become a widow with two daughters. She is regarded in the region as an excellent, highly knowledgeable landlady. Yevlampia left the province after her father's death and was not heard from again, except the narrator claims to have recognized her in passing on the road once, and she seemed to, be, to have become the mother figure in a radical religious sect. And that's uh, really where the story ends. Uh, the plot is simple enough, but it is suffused uh, with political symbolism. Although Turgenev does not follow Shakespeare and the latter's explicit use of mythic and historical national figures, 
There are lexical indices around the figure of Harlov um, suggesting his legendary stature throughout. Uh, there's also several indices that mark Harlov as, uh, on my account, reminiscent or in some way related to Peter the Great. These motifs are built through repeated uses of suggested words such as derjava and vlast, prozostroval, poslushania, sud, roditoskuyu volu, and many others, uh, including several instances of cognates for service. Uh, these motifs and word choices suggest um, to which Russian conditions Turgenev turned to craft his Lear story not only uh, that not that only loosely resembles Shakespeare's in, in the details. Uh, the imperial family feud and sins of the father in, in Russian political history, as discussed in a correspond a very interesting correspondence between Herzen and Turgenev, also shares these motifs. And it is the same thing that Turgenev writes about in his above mentioned unfinished essay on the significance of the Russian nobility. Peter the Great's legacy still loomed large in Tsar Alexander II's era of reforms. There are many historiographical anxieties about Peter's reign during the 19th century, and Alexander II was often compared to Peter the Great as an analogous reforming czar. In many ways, when Alexander II announced in spring of 1856 that he planned to uh, abolish serfdom and emancipate Russia's serfs, it was as if he was undoing a part of Peter's legacy. Peter's reform had not only deepened the subjugation of serfs to the landowning nobility, but also deepened the subjugation of landowning nobility to the new bureaucratic state. Peter's reforms made the nobility as a class no longer hereditary, but service-based. And while the nobility gained some rights in the process, primarily rights over the serfs tied to their land, they also lost political power vis-a-vis -vis the state. Uh, Turgenev's tale of Harlov figuratively illustrates this identity and service-based predicament of the Russian gentry. Uh, reading King Lear of the Steps in this frame has great effect in terms of how he might rethink the conceptual concerns, concerns and political imagination of emergent Russian liberalism and many of its advocates, including Ivan Turgenev. Even in the midst of law, witnesses, consent, and the hyperformal partitional act at the center of the story, Neglect, abuse, and tyranny exist everywhere in the surrounding spaces. There is a hint at why a duality of legality and brutality continues to exist amongst a noble class aspiring to shape itself in its sovereign's image. Throughout Turgenev's short story, public duty and service seem to stand opposed to any private sentiment or emotion. It is as if public service has to involve total detachment from one's private sentiment. Truly, the significance of the Russian nobility in Tur Turgenev's King Lear seems empty of everything except its imperative to imitate its founding sovereigns in the exercise of impersonal authority over obedient subjects. In such an arrangement, the recourse to law and consent does not um, curb neglect and dissuade tyranny. Tyranny can even be said to be the spirit of the law itself, born of a bargain between sovereign and, nobil and, nobil and nobility that cemented serfdom in Russia's imperial way of life. Unlike Shakespeare's play, Turgenev's story allows for no reconciliation, and Harlov dies without either forgiving or cursing his daughter. He dies having admitted to himself shortly before that he should have used his authority to do something good, like uh, free his serf, free his serfs, Krestan Navoli at Pustil, that he had taken these sins, Greca, uh, on his soul and that he had sacrificed his conscience, solvest, for his children. Moreover, instead of reconciliation, redemption, and renewal, Turgenev's short story ends with replication. Harlov had nothing to pass on to his children but a, co a coveting of authority, and they made use of it. The elder daughter, Anna, becomes a stern, law-abiding, decent landowner like her father before her decent here um, in scare quotes. And the younger daughter, Yevlampia, becomes a mother figure in a flagellant religious sect, a woman who, quote, radiated confidence in her overabundance or surfeit of authority, unquote. Um, yeah, so uh, how do I think Russian thinkers sort of challenge the affective symbolic aspects of their society's absolutist imaginary? Um, in this sort of around the time of the great reforms, I simply have three hypotheses that I 
working through on my uh, in my research. For one, I believe they imagined the problem of Russia's imperial political history from the perspective of a kind of family affair, uh, not unlike the way in which uh, Lynn Hunt uh, says France in its revolutionary period imagined its uh, political history as a, as a sort of family romance. Um, I also hypothesize that uh, uh, I suggest that Russian writers uh, tended to rethink the forms that families might take rather than throwing the political role of the family out with the absolutist father. Um, so the state still remains a kind of family, um, but maybe the father doesn't isn't necessarily the head. Uh, maybe there is is no necessary head of the family, um, and so forth. And uh, finally, I believe that these writers emphasize the affective relationships that must transform in order for liberalism's hard institutions to work. The political bond still requires the cultivation of, of, of certain feelings. Um, thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Christy, for this uh, extremely rich presentation. I just want to turn uh, things over to Allison for comments. Great, thank you so much. Um, I thoroughly enjoyed reading the paper um, and then hearing this presentation, which um, you know, expanded a couple of things and gave up uh, and anyway, I, I enjoyed the entire process of sort of engaging with this paper. Um, but I have to say, I found it kind of hard to come up with what exactly to comment on in part because it's so rich and there were so many different ways that I could possibly go with this. Um, so in the interest of time, since we've got a good crowd here and I know that I'm, there are a lot of questions, I'll sort of focus on one or maybe two, depending on how you interpret the link, if I'm successful in making the link between two ideas into a single idea, um, I think we'll go. And above all, uh, what I'd like to do is think about ways of inserting sort of some thinking about Seslovia or class and gender um, into this process and into this, this conversation. Um, so to start, I was really struck by the way that you linked your fa the family state idiom to studies of liberalism in Russia, sort of at the start of your uh, paper slash uh, presentation. Um, your very gentle critique of the ways that liberalism has been studied in Russia uh, really echoes to me a lot of the ways uh, that people have come to critique the ways that say Russia's middle class or bourgeoisie has been studied when it comes to Russian social history. Um, and that's something that's really been part of, you know, well critiqued for, you know, at around 20 years or something like that. So Louise McReynolds in her Russia at Play of 2003 um, sort of commented that historians who have tended to focus on the middle class based on economic or precisely these sorts of liberal political visions um, have really doomed Russia's middle class to insignificance. Um, and the quote from her is that the paradigm historians constructed was skewed from the outset because it was based on a premise that accepted the Western model as normative. Um, and that's become a really big critique in a lot of areas, I think, of Russian history, uh, particularly of the 18th and 19th century, whether it's of middle class issues um, or of civil society, uh, the sort of tendency to understand Russia of the past and to an extent today that's been overly influenced uh, by these sort of outside visions of what normalcy is. Um, and as somebody who I see here, Brad Bradley had put it, or this is a slight tweaking of his argument, a tendency to look for what was not there as opposed to what was there. Um, and this sort of importance of really looking at what really was there and then going from there. Uh, but of course, one of the things that your paper really brings out very well is that it's hard to do that because so many of the 19th century Russians were themselves engaged in exactly this sort of process of understanding themselves, of looking at themselves uh, in terms of these comparisons, whether that was explicit or implicit. And so that's one of the extra challenges, I think, of making those sorts of connections. Um, but I think it's really um, important maybe to think about the ways that the linkage between liberalism and the middle class has so often been understood and the ways that the sort of imagined absence of a Russia and middle class in Russia has affected the vision of liberalism. And I think maybe is one of the things that has led to these challenges um, and how this link is or is not reflected in this family state idiom. Um, on the one hand, it seems not at all um, given the degree to which both this paper, but also, you know, you could say 
that 19th century literature is you know, really heavily about the nobility. Obviously there are big exceptions. Um, I'm sure you cover them in all of this, uh, but there is such a vision of this sort of 19th century family world as being one in which the sort of noble experience is in particular sort of parsed and understood um, and thought through in these, in these ways. But I think there's something very important about this particular moment in time, this emancipation, great reform era, um, that may be one of the ways of sort of helping to broaden the vision of what actually the Russian nobility means. Um, this is this moment when the nobility loses its one major remaining source of standing, which was the exclusive right to own serfs, which was really the single, I mean, there's some other things too, but that's probably the single greatest thing that marked the nobility as distinctly different. Um, and that's now suddenly gone. And I suppose the question could be asked as to whether this sort of allows the nobility to start to stand in in a different role, uh, to stand in for the middle class as it emerges from serf ownership uh, to a more uncertain source of status that may be tied into some other visions. Um, and I think too that um, in the process of thinking through the ways that the family is contextualized and problematized by these reform era sort of authors and thinkers, particularly if the focus is on noble families, then it's worth very thinking very carefully about the role um, of gender, of the gendered nature of this idiom. Uh, certainly some of the recent literature on noble families, and I think above all of Kate Pickering on Tonova's and Ordinary Marriage, uh, really focus a lot on the gendered nature of the noble family. And in particular on the ways that a lot of what we might expect those gender roles to be, again, largely based on sort of outside experiences or, or expectations, um, really turn out not to be true, either entirely or partially. Um, so in other words, the family part of the family state idiom um, really starts to sort of diverge or develop in interesting ways when you bring in this sort of gendered elements to it. But it might also be helpful to sort of think about the state part of that as well, um, to either dismantle um, or at least to resist overemphasizing the sort of Petrine father patriarchy connection. Um, I could do this by making a, a, an argument about, you know, Peter starting some reforms, but not really finishing them and it taking Catherine the Great to put order to everything, <laughs> frankly, is something I would make. Um, that you could make a, as good a case for Catherine as the mother of the empire, as father, as Peter as the father. But of course, nobody really takes that seriously, despite the fact that frankly, she's no more problematic a parent or spouse than Peter was, but that's a whole another story. You know, but like there is a reason, of course, why that's not the story that happens. And part of it is the specific 19th century czars. But again, thinking through some of these ways that this vision of both the family and the state in some ways challenge the ability to sort of create these sorts of affective communities in, through this family state idiom, um, at least as they might develop as in your sort of comparative cases. Um, the sort of Holy Roman Empire, slash, especially if you look to the Austrian Empire, might be a really interesting comparison just with the after the sort of later understanding of Maria Theresa. But in other ways, thinking through some of the ways that this is linked both to gender and class strikes me as a potentially really fruitful way of helping to develop some of these ideas more. And I'll pause there because again, I'm sure there are tons more questions out there. Thank you. Um... <clears throat> Thank you so much, Allison, um, and thank you for being so patient uh, in the process of, of my developing and writing this and um, for going through and providing these really helpful comments. Uh, just very briefly, um, yes, absolutely. <laughs> um, I, um, I am looking for ways to think about, uh, yeah, there's so much I could say about class and gender. Um, and part of that is probably, especially in chapter three, is probably going to come through um, my my analysis of, of my own sort of political analysis of fathers and children, um, where I think Adyenseva is a fascinating character there, and where I think even just this idea, um, sort of Enlightenment idea, where reform was sort of seen as separating liberal values from mercantile values, uh, mercantile uh, values. Uh, 
is really interesting to me, uh, just even considering um, Bazarov as well, um, <laughs> whose who's name to me even just suggests a kind of market <laughs> um, in, in its own way. Uh, I, I definitely take I definitely take that comment to heart, um, and and I'm still very much working on this. Does this allow the nobility to stand in for the middle class? Um, does the sort of situation allow the nobility to stand in as the middle class? That's just such an excellent way to, to put that, <clears throat> and I'm going to need to keep thinking on that. So thank you. And as for the gender nation nature of the of the noble family, <clears throat> yes, I I. I, um, Anna Berman has actually uh, recently um, suggested to me to sort of add in a, a chapter on uh, one of the 19th uh, century uh, female writers, and I desperately want to do this, and I, and I hope I have time to do it, um, but even if I don't, if I'm sort of lucky enough to turn this into some kind of a book, I, that's certainly the first goal, <laughs> um, is, is to add in that perspective. Um, um, hmm. I do uh, sort of lastly, I, I guess I, I am still even in the uh, even in the sort of look at Sepnoi Korolir, I'm still thinking about the choices Turgenev makes there um, uh, with the daughters and and what's what's being said there about that relationship and that like very strange sort of um, Sort of rejection of a marriage plot as well in there that sort of shows up in there um so yes i a thousand percent agree and i i'm i'm definitely still thinking on on that uh, thank thank you allison thanks very much uh um uh, uh christy and allison uh so now we are moving on to to questions and i will pass this on to sasha okay it looks like we have a question from andrea Liu. Yeah, thank you so much for this wonderful talk. I just have a really small detail question. Um, earlier in your talk, you said John, Le John Locke rejects the idea that parental power could be the image after which to model political power because the former was temporary and survival based and the latter permanent and property based. And I just was a bit confused because it seems it's the reverse, no, or are not parental relations, quote unquote, permanent and property based, whereas political power is unstable quote unquote temporary and survival based. It was just one of your um, your graphics, your, your slides or whatever. If you could just please uh, yeah, uh, clarify that, that statement. Thank you so much, appreciate it. Yeah, Andrea, thank you. That's actually, <laughs> it's actually one of my, um, it actually struck me as one of my uh, sort of favorite little tidbits <laughs> as I was writing um, because it is, it is in a way strange, <laughs> um, but I think, I think you're right that one could interpret it that way, but I think the reason that Locke is eager to draw that distinction between um, like the different uh, the different uh, like aims of family and state is is, re is really uh, because of this sort of because of the, the sort of property matter and and the wanting to make uh, state relations uh, far more contractual because uh uh if the family so if the family the family in a in the sort of domestic household sense is certainly not particularly permanent um one dies and then passes on things and and maybe in that sense a sort of more dynastic family is attempts to be permanent but the sort of biological family is not um generations come and, and generations go uh and the issue of how power sort of uh moves between generations is this thing that Locke thinks can be contractually figured out in the interest of protecting property whereas in sort of everyday uh effect of family relations uh there's uh, no guarantee that that one that one can uh settle that sort of tension um and there's no guarantee that any kind of, of contract there uh would be established um, so i think that's what i think that's what's lot what Locke is doing but certainly it's a very um somewhat counterintuitive way of thinking about it and i think he's doing it on purpose because of his 
uh, because of his um, eagerness to really submit contract um, in in the state. I hope that. Yeah, yeah thank you so much. I appreciate it. Um, I'm just curious, were you um, able to uh, were you able to do the research reading the sources in, in Russian or did you have to read them in translation usually? Oh, no, I, I read the sources in Russian. Um, oh. Yeah. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thanks. For no problem. Great. Emily Wang, you can go ahead and ask a question. I'll unmute you. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you, Christy, for this presentation and to Allison for your comments. I learned so much from this and I, I really hope that, uh, you know, Obviously, you know, you have to finish your dissertation and graduate, but it would be great to have this as a book. I think that it would be uh, really useful for the Slavic community, um, especially the, the political science perspective that you bring to the question of defining liberalism, which is becoming increasing. I mean, it's difficult in the 19th century. It's, it's increasingly difficult in, in the current day because the term continues to morph. So I think that uh, this would be a, a a, a very generous gift to all of us when you have the time and energy to, to do that. But um, I wanted to ask a question again, relating to the definitions of liberalism. And again, I'm not a, a political scientist. I think that the, the political definitions that you offered were really useful and seem clear. Um, as, a, as a literary scholar, sometimes, um, and, and someone who's working in the early 19th century, um, I keep seeing different political orientations slipping into each other. And again, that's probably also a difference of the time periods because the early 19th century is different. But, you know, uh, liberals or radicals and conservatives would sometimes be on the same page and sometimes not on the same page. And for me, it's been sometimes easier to distinguish between, you know, if we if we made three groupings, radicals, liberals, and conservatives, which, again, that's sort of making up categories, but um, it's easier to distinguish them when you think about them politically rather than effectively, because um, sometimes the emotional models or the, the effective models are, are reused by different groups. And I was just wondering if you were, um, in, in your research on, on this later period, you were struggling with similar, similar issues of distinction. I think that the point that you made about the difference between the hierarchical familia model and the horizontal familia model is potentially a really useful way of distinguishing between conservatives and liberals, but um, doesn't the horizontal model, and again, you know the, the later 19th century better than I do, but uh, the, the horizontal model seems to appear among both liberals and radicals in the later 19th century. And I was just wondering if, um, you know, you saw any sort of slippage in the use of emotional models between these two groups that were at least theoretically sometimes opposed to each other? Or if you also sometimes see a distinction between radical effective models and liberal effective models? Mm -hmm. Sorry, that was a long question. I hope no, it was, no, no, I, I hope I, it was clear. I, no, I follow you, I follow you. Okay, okay, thank you. Um, I am, yes, <laughs> the answer is yes, I <laughs> do. It's very difficult, uh, both from a sort of theoretical standpoint, like the history of, of these uh, theoretical traditions of thought and from the sort of concrete historical case standpoint to parse through what everyone means when they're talking about liberals and radicals and conservatives and Republicans. <laughs> it's, there's so much going on. Um, and I, my thought was by choosing um, by choosing Aksakov, uh, Turgenev, and Chernyshevsky, my thought was to view this family state idiom sort of across an, an ideological spectrum that would take into account um, a more conservative uh, uh, figure who might be considered and maybe a certain, I don't know, classical or early romantic light as a sort of uh, liberty loving person who, who saw liberty as a sort of uh, carving out of, of these interior spaces uh, to cultivate expression, um, uh, carving out space on his gentry estate to sort of cultivate these sort of gen like experiments of generosity of feeling and all of these things. Um, so, I mean, a very, possibly like a very cons conservative um, 
liberty focused project there that recognizes that the nobility is sort of um, uh, circumscribed into these these particular areas of being able to express their liberal feelings and, and possibly being okay with that um, if you're ex hoc of um, to to you know to, to more liberal Turgenev and then more more radical Chernyshevsky who I mean I think fathers and children is is, is really interesting um, I mean there's a, a lot of the sort of lexicon and indices in, in Stepanoi Karolir um, really stresses exactly how hierarchical this sort of um, generous partitional act is and, and sort of hi how hierarchical everything is that runs in relation to the, into the fam in, in the family, which I think is very different from, well, at least on my reading, sort of very different from what, what ends up coming out of um, uh, the Kirsan. Kirsan, Kirsanov's um, in, in Fathers and Children, where, you know, there's, there is the like awkward open question of, okay, I mean, it seems that uh, Arkady has accepted, um, has, has, has accepted this, uh, I suppose, still in served <laughs> um, Russian woman uh, as his father's partner and the, the the mother of his brother his stepbrother and everyone seems to be in this sort of in nice <laughs> like ending uh the family there minus Bazarov, of course who's who's uh sort of top-down view of things um doesn't really reconcile with sort of feelings of love and he doesn't know what to do with that um but yeah I think I think definitely those horizontal views are something that are sort of looked at and and share between both like sort of moderate liberals like Turgenev and more sort of radical like democratic <laughs> forces uh, who have a, another conception of 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 liberty um and and the last thing to note there is that on that note of sort of um a sort of horizontal model um I really wish I could have had space <laughs> To, in the dissertation to really talk about uh, Golovlovi, uh, which I think is a is a perfect example of sort of um, a possible kind of liberal critique of these sort of mercantile values and how they sort of seep inside um, the family. I think Ginny Kaminer has, has just done an incredible um, study of that. Uh, and that might be another sort of push towards <laughs> more, more sort of affective, uh, open, horizontal relations within a family, not sort of focus on the, you know, uh, contractual passing on of property every generation. Um, so anyway, I'll be quiet now. <laughs> Thank you for that question. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah, I'm looking forward to reading it. Yeah, you had a follow-up question. You can go ahead. Yes, thank you. Um, thanks, uh, Christy, once again. Uh, this was super thought-provoking. Uh, I just wanted to follow up on, on Emily's question uh, a little bit, which was that, uh, you know, I, I mean, I, I wonder if the, the, the vertical, uh, vertical horizontal model um, is flexible enough to, to make a distinction like the one that Emily is pointing to, as I understand it, between, let's say, uh, companionate marriage uh, logics that are, um, I think, more or less, um, you know, that we might associate with the kind of liberalism on the one hand. And on the other hand, uh, um, on the other hand, the, the, um, a kind of radical critique of the family, right? That we have among the radicals, right? <laughs> uh, in other words, right? That is, a, that is like an extremely prominent dimension of what's happening at, at this moment, right? We have critique of the family, we have the family sort of breaking out of its boundaries uh, we have stories about that, uh, lots of stories about that. And so I wonder if it might make sense for you to kind of frame that also, um, that, that other side, right? So there's, you might imagine it in, in terms of at least three uh, logics that are operating at the same time, a patriarchalist, a companionate sort of uh, tendency towards the nuclear family. And then on the third hand, the, the, the idea that, uh, you know, and I think Anna, Berman is here and probably is able to speak more about more more eloquently about this, but I just wonder, right? The 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 testing the boundaries of the family and potentially a kind of um, right that that's that seems to be much more radical than simply a move towards companion companionate uh, 
companion of logics. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, and I think that's. Um, I mean, I think that's. I think that's definitely a sort of scheme that maps on very well to to Aksakov and Turgenev and Chernyshevsky for sure. With Chernyshevsky being the one who um, is radically reimagining like what the family could look like. Um, certainly, um, I think. I think that's fine. Um, I'm not uh, I, in fine, fine in terms of sort of my arguments about um, sort of like how in the encounter with sort of liberal ideas and liberal reform transforms a family state idiom. Uh, yeah, I mean, one of the ways is that the family itself like is reimagined as an institution um, in radical ways. And that um, I like, I like that Kenan Ferguson says that, you know, regardless of like, regardless of how the family is defined, uh, regardless of sort of what kinds of forms it takes, um, it's still, there's still something about it that forces a, a very particular and interesting affect of negotiation of things and sort of relationships and obligations that we mirror only with sort of like very legal uh, prescriptions in public political life. And so I think even in Chernyshevsky, uh, even Chernyshevsky, even though he's uh, sort of radically redoing and remaking like the form of the family, it's still participating in this sort of, what I see as a sort of 19th century uh, literary tradition in, in Imperial Russia of um, <laughs> exactly using the family state idiom, however one transform it, transforms it to critique this former sort of absolutist imaginary that one's trying to move away from into some, some different conception of, of a more freer autonomous society. Um, but yes, I, I have written down that scheme and actually will probably be very, very fruitful for me as I go for it. Thank you. Um, and we have a question from, let's see, sorry. Um, Sergei Bogatyrev, uh, I was thinking about Daub's point that the German romantics sought to celebrate communal life by focusing on family and marriage. How does the Russian debate on obsession with the peasant commune in the middle of the 19th century fit in your analysis of Russian liberalism from a familial perspective? Hmm. Now that's a that's a that's a great question and probably one that I'm not going to give a satisfactory satisfactory answer for. Uh, because I, um, unfortunately, yeah, because I, I, as I think someone noted, um, I do, I do spend a lot of time on, on the, on the Gentry family, um, and thinking about that and, and the ways that writers were critiquing it as a particular, playing a particular role in sort of absolutist oppression. But I mean, yeah, I hadn't thought about German German romantics specifically celebrating it um, by focusing on sort of sort of marriage, which is interesting, or different kinds of marriage, which is interesting. Which, of course, as, as I said, I'll definitely have to read more about in the German case, which is um, sort of my my weakest um, case, my weakest background. Um, yeah, I'm I'm not sure. Um, is my very unsatisfactory answer. And that definitely is something that I can think on some more. Um, obsession with the peasant commun commune. Um, yeah, I, I will probably have to think on that some more. I'm not um, sufficiently <laughs> versed in, in debates around the, the peasant commune to to, to have a satisfac satisfactory answer. So I'm sorry, but I, I have written it down. <laughs> yeah, and we have a question from Valeria Sobol. Um, thanks, Christy, for such a stimulating talk. I just wanted to say that Alexey Vdovin is working on a Stepnoi Karol Lir and is working on Stepnoi Karol Lir and Affect. We just had a discussion of his work in progress on that a couple of weeks ago in the Mad Fridays talk series organized by University of Munich. Might be able, helpful to get in touch with him and compare notes. Another question and clarification from Andrea Liu. Uh, there was a point in your talk where you said 
And this was the point at which Russia gained a self-consciousness about XYZ or a self-criticality. Can you remind me what you were referring to when you said that? I think perhaps maybe you were quoting a different author saying that, but what was that referring to? That was uh, that was explaining sort of Cornelius, Cornelius Castoriadis, who's a philosopher uh, and who sort of did a lot of work on um, talking about the social imaginary and what it is. That was him saying that in his point of view, Russia gained autonomy or became an autonomous society at the point at which it uh, became alienated and was able to critique its own sort of institutions, uh, specifically those uh, having to do with uh, rule and law. Um, and he says that he thinks, he doesn't say, he doesn't say why he thinks this happens in around the 1830s and around the 1860s. Um, I posited my own, um, my own interpretation of that as uh, it's just the moment at which you've just had sort of the Decemberist revolt. Um, and you're also then in the 60s having the, the, um, the emancipation uh, of the serfs. And that around these times, you're getting um, a lot of talk and debate and intellectual circles about what the Decemberist vote means and what constitutionalism means and is it uh, adaptable to Russia and what does emancipation mean? Um, what does it mean for the nobility? I think as, as Allison had, had pointed out in her discussion points that, okay, the nobility is basically defined in both identity and in sort of service duties as this landowning estate uh, that holds serfs uh, and sort of mirrors sovereign authority through that role. Um, so I think uh, he thinks this is what makes Russian society in, at this, in these times between the, the 1830s and the 1860s um, autonomous. And it's more self-critical than self-conscious uh, because I it was probably self-conscious before. I mean, with things like Gerardyshev and on and on, like already a sort of historical consciousness there. Uh, but that 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 criticality, that self criticism, is what makes it um, autonomous. Okay, we have a question from Svetlana Grenier. Uh, Chernyshevsky ends up with companionate marriage and sodialik. Do we have more radical critiques than that? <laughs> hmm. If by radical critiques, you mean, do we have any more sort of radical transformations? I mean, I think we have more radical critiques, but none that, uh, none that maybe end up with such a like radically different form past sort of, um, I mean, yeah, I mean, do we? <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, I mean, it's a great question. Um, I'm trying to think, I mean, uh, I don't know, maybe, I don't know. <laughs> um, certainly in my imagination, yeah, I think Ilya has a point on this. And certainly in my imagination, I, I assume someone like Chernyshevsky or Bakunin or someone <laughs> has some other thoughts on this, but Ilya. Did <laughs> well, I just, I just to jump in because uh, Svetlana and I are having a little conversation in, in chat about this, but you know, just a couple of a couple of demarcations are possible, right? First of all, Chernyshevsky does end up with a, with a companionate marriage, but one that looks very, very different from what we're used to, right? Given how it's placed and how it's framed and how it's contextualized and so on. But I think we know, you know, it would be interesting to come up with a with a literary text. One would have to go, um, you know, uh, uh, probably. I'm I'm not quite sure if we if we if we have a a published literary text that ends with, say, a triangular arrangement or, or a quadrangular arrangement. We certainly have prominent culturally um, weighty, important uh, instances of this in real life, which, right, you know, the, the, Nikras, the Nikrasov circle, the Shechenov circle, right, um, all of these cases which, although not specifically literary, literary were, of course, I think more, if not more prominent in, 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 um, in culture. 
more broadly. But yeah, that's I, I'm not sure if somebody has more radical endings, I would be curious. But I don't know, Svetlana, what do you think? Well, yes, thanks, Ilya. Well, I, I, this was a follow up to what you propose as the three different, you know, models, sort of the patriarchal, companionate, and radical. And so, mm -hmm. I, you know, like what are the literary representations of that? And it seems that, you know, in Chernyshevsky, it's still basically a companionate marriage. But I was just wondering if anybody has other examples of something uh anna is writing something on a berman so maybe you... <laughs> um this was so great and i had a question i put a question earlier on something different but just on this one i mean i was just thinking about what would make it radical right so i think the unmarried woman in some ways is arguably a more radical ending for family by choosing not to have one um and then it seemed like when people are looking for radical in this conversation they're looking for sexual relations that go beyond the two but why does it have to be sexual because i think radical could also be the all these weird family conglomerations and i can think of quite a few where you have people who are not necessarily all biologically related and they may not be sleeping together but they formed a family unit so i think that's also radical so i think we could find a lot of radical ones and with chernyshevsky it's bigamy we also have to remember that in terms of what makes it radical right like that's not an ending you could get in an English novel in terms of like, if you're getting companionate marriage. Um, anyway, enough on that. My other question, because I, I really enjoy this and I know less on the political theory side, thinking a lot about the kind of um, family state model you're setting up, it base, was based always on the fatherland. And I was curious how Matushka, Moskva or, you know, how, when it's the motherland, how that fits in? Because sometimes it's mother Russia, father czar, and their children, which is a different construction than you would get in France or England, or I assume, I don't know, German as German model as well either. But I was curious how that fits in. And I was thinking that shows up in some of the novels, I mean, very explicitly in War and Peace, where they're setting this up over and over again about, and it's often their Matushka Moskva, right? They're trying to save her, but they're saving Russia. Um, and the czar is a father. But then there's other things like even the end of um, of Goncharov's The Precipice, where the last thing is there's like his grandmother behind him and that great babushka, you know, Russia. Um, so anyway, I just wonder if you had a thought on the mother Russia, father Russia and the different constructions that creates. Okay. Yes, uh, actually this makes, I will immediately, <laughs> I now am also extremely, curious as to how Yanovsky and his sort of in his dictionary uh, had what whether he has uh, some um, whether he has some entry for Matush uh, yeah uh, for Rodina even or any any anything like this um, I will look that up immediately um, uh, could you repeat the just like the, the the last part of the question Oh yeah, no, it was just thinking about the different construction. Either you have, if you have just the fatherland, it's sort of a one-to-one -one duty of sons to their father. But if you have Russia as the mother and the czar as father and the children, people, like there's a different family construction you get there where you have two at the top or yeah. there's a different dynamic. And I was curious how that would reshape some of the theories. I see. So, right. So you're thinking um, in some of, right. So, uh, it, regarding like the Holy Alliance and those reactionary regimes, those absolutist regimes, they definitely thought that obviously uh, the stability of the state depended on uh, the sort of kind of patriarchal power, which presupposes the husband's superiority even over the wife in these uh, in these schemes. But what you're saying is maybe it could even be that that superiority in some places in, in Russia's imaginary doesn't really exist <laughs> between sort of um, uh, the fatherland and, and the motherland, which is interesting and provocative. And I suppose this goes back to someone else's question, uh, comments, or maybe it was Allison again, who, who would ask about Catherine as well. Um, and I definitely think um, there has been a lot of, uh, a lot of excellent work done on, on exactly this sort of thing about uh, Catherine positing herself as sort of the, the mother um, the mother of, of the empire, and maybe, I mean, probably directly <laughs> in relation to Peter being the father of the empire, and that they, um, 
I think, well, yeah, I'm not, the one thing that I'm unsure of is that I don't think, I think Peter, I think Peter's reign, I think Peter's reign really sort of solidified this idea of sort of um, the state, uh, like having a father and these kinds of things. Uh, but it's really Catherine, Catherine's regime that takes the family state idiom and like specifically uses it, uh, instrumentalizes it to sort of legislate affections that like this is going to be the thing that ties the nobility to service. Um, and I don't, I don't think like Peter was engaged in any of that. Um, so, so may, I mean, yeah, maybe it is a sort of, I, yeah, maybe, maybe there is some parody there more than like Catherine being a lesser sort of parent. I mean, they're both huge <laughs> in this imaginary. I can I just Alice throw something, oh, sorry, can I throw something in there real quick about the service thing? Because I think one of the things that's interesting is, I mean, it really comes in with Peter the Third, not with Catherine, but then she keeps it. But when he emancipates the Russian nobility from service, it is instead like, I don't, you don't have to be forced to do this now. You understand that you, <laughs> are the, you know, the ones who serve. Like this, you, I don't have to make this so because you'll just do it. And yeah. so I think that there is this idea that there is the lesson, Peter had to pull everybody into service, but now it's understood. It is part of everybody's conception of themselves as part of this state, which fits into this really nicely, I think. Oh, wow. Yeah, okay, yes. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to, I am furiously scribbling all of this down. <laughs> uh, this is very helpful. Uh, thank, thank you for these, for these comments. Uh, so we have a question from Joseph Bradley. Can you hear me? Yes. I muted. it, okay. So thanks for a very uh, stimulating, not only presentation, but, but, the, but the ideas. I mean, you make several contributions, I think, not only to political theory, although that too, but more broadly to a Russian political culture. And a couple of them, a couple of your um, conclusions interest me in particular. One is I think you want to detach ideas of liberalism from individualism uh, and connect liberalism to um, collectivities, I mean, such as the family. Um, but that, that makes Russian liberalism different in a way from some, some, although not all, of West European theory, which emphasizes liberal uh, individualism uh, and individual rights. Um, the other thing that, that uh, interests me is your uh, taking liberalism away from uh, ideas of um, institutional groundings, constitutions, parliaments, law, law codes, things like that. And I think um, some of the literature on civil society, voluntary associations, I might mention my own book on this. Um, I think some of that literature is trying to do similar things. I know I was up against uh, in thinking about civil society that the argument that how could Russia possibly have ever had one? And I think to a great degree, certainly at the beginning of the 19th century, but um, throughout the 19th century, civil society was largely an, an imaginary or an imaginary impulse um, motivated people to try to be active uh, in or voluntary associations, in the press, things like that. And so I'm, I'm curious to see if, whether or not that literature might complement um, what you're trying to do as ways of uh, taking, uh, taking liberalism away from um, these kind of older, older notions of institutional, institutional groundings. Uh, thank you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, yes. <laughs> Previously, when I had, um, when I had focused mostly in comparative politics as opposed to political theory, which I, I moved into, I was fascinated with these ideas of civil society and the sort of common or faint frame that sort of it's similar to liberalism, right? That like Russia has no experience with civil society. It has no experience with liberalism. And I just thought that just certainly just could not be true. Um, and um, I, I, starting from that sort of civil society point, um, civil society is largely an imaginary impulse. I mean, yes, I mean, I, I think 
part of what Helen, Helena Rosenblatt is trying to do with her lost, lost histories of liberalism is specifically to look at societies that have been, and actually only recently, uh, I think Rosenblatt thinks that um, the sort of fixation on liberalism as this legalistic, hard, institutional uh, sort of um, phenomena is a very Anglo-American 20th century. Some would even say only since the Cold War have we really aligned liberalism with that. And what she's trying to say is, is exactly this, that uh, civitas, liberalitas, like all of these like much older sort of ideas, um, even you know as far back as, 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 as Rome, um, they are the things that funneled into liberalism as it was practiced in, in sort of the, the 17th, 18th and 19th centuries. So like these are the, the kind of things that we should be looking at. Um, and I, I do wanna say, I um, yes, if you have any <laughs> literature on civil society um, to share with me in, in that vein, I'd be, I'd be very grateful for it. Um, th thank you. Look at my book, there's a lot of literature cited in there. I mean, that's about 10 years ago, but uh, that's a good start. Thank you, yeah, I will. <laughs> thank you. Okay, so we have a question from Alexei Yevstrata. Uh, um, my remark leads me to a question and the remark uh, was for more radical alternative religious groups, for more radical alternative religious groups would be an inspiration. Um, and I'm not even gonna try to read that word because I'm gonna butcher it. <laughs> uh, so, Definitely do take a note of that, Christine. I'll send you um, a transcript of this chat because there's a lot of discussion going on here that I'm sure. Oh, can you. can you? Is that absolutely. I've been trying to like take yes. notes in the margins. Yes, yeah, there's absolutely. so much there. <laughs> yes. Um, yes. And so the question is, um, could you comment more extensively on the place of religious narratives oh. and institutions in your analyses? Yes, <laughs> I tried for the sake of space to bracket off so much in this presentation, but a thousand percent part of what uh, Rosenblatt does in her uh, sort of looking at France and Germany, and I would argue one could also look at Russia as one of these lost liberalisms. Uh, part of what she does is say that, you know, uh, since the sort of Anglo-American takeover of, of the meaning of liberalism, uh, Germany's uh, contributions to, to the development have been largely just completely ignored or under uh, 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 underplayed, and Germany's contributions are are to these sort of ideas of um, religious toleration, um, uh, sort of uh, liberal theology. Like that's sort of Germany's uh, contribution there early on, and so it made me really interested. You know, at the end of Stepnoy Korolir, uh, that you know one of the daughters ends up in this like really radical religious sect and I honestly I mean <laughs> I don't know enough about that sect although there was a really good book that recently came out from NLO on um on I, I, I have no idea how to pronounce that but like those the the flagellants there's a really good book on it and and maybe maybe reading that can can shed some light on it um but yes <laughs> there's a whole can of worms about sort of religion, uh, orthodoxy, and um, certainly, I think certainly Nicholas the first sort of pitting all of those things against, you know, through his uh, participation in, in, in the Holy Alliance against liberalism and its attack on duty and and um, sort of religion, religious reverence and family, all these kinds of old traditions. Um, but yeah, but I mean, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's, it's hard to say because on the one hand, um, some of those religious, radical religious groups are radical specifically because they're breaking outside of that um, sort of hegemonic mold of everything is sort of must be orthodoxy and this is all tied into the state and everything. But on the other hand, uh, they have their own sort of strict hierarchical um, and conservative uh, sort of values. Um, Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, I guess, Alexi, could I ask you what you mean by uh, these sort of alternative religious groups serving as an inspiration? Do you mean an inspiration for uh, liberty-minded critique or something else? Uh, critique of social organization in general, yeah. Which is introductions could be helpful as a start. 
Yes, that's the book I was talking about uh, from from Ed. Yes, that's exactly the book. Thank you for reminding me of the of the author. Of course, Alexander Etkin. Um, hmm, critique of social organization. Okay, if, yes, if I want to at some point veer into or comment on that religious uh, aspect, um, yes, that would be a, a good place to, to start. Um, definitely a critique of social organization, but then I would have to wonder what they did uh, with sort of uh, family, and family organization specifically in this case, that would be of interest. Uh, thank you. Just very quickly, I see that, I see that uh, Bill Nickel had a remark that I did want to respond to where he talks about um, maybe interesting to relate the abdicating father and in, in, in Turgenev's Lear with other figures of strong women standing uh, in for abdicating men. And this is a uh, uh when Bazarov was sort of a failed pretender to the male role. And even in general, like Adyantseva's, like her marriage setup, like the, the sort of, hmm. The way that she navigates that is, is even seems in itself radical in a, in a different kind of way. Um, the way that she remarries and it's sort of, I, she remarries, but it's a very, I don't know. It, it doesn't, it, it, it seems outside in, in some ways of the sort of absolutist mold of, 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 of marriage perhaps, but I have to think more on that. Um, but yes, Bill, I, I take your comment. Thank you. Uh, just to follow up on our um, Janoszewski discussion, I just uh, shortly say that, Christy, thank you for your talk. And I agree with all the speakers who said that as a Slavic field, we need this conversation to be happening. So this is this is really great. As far as Janoszewski is concerned, I just wanted to make a point that it's not, so he goes beyond just companion marriage, right? He develops this whole communist utopia, which like, I think it was Turgenev and the, uh, who said it's a brothel. He ends with a brothel <laughs> and it's brave, right? This whole fourth dream of Vera Pavlovna and it's kind of reenactment in reality is more just a marriage. It's like this community where uh, women have different partners and men probably as well. So there is a complex, but obviously not um, uh, kind of not limited, open-ended kind of structure of the family. And it directly relates to political utopia because a brothel or what Turgenev is called a brothel becomes a formula of a kind of communism, which is pretty radical, I would say. And especially if we think about how discussions of the position of women are relevant for Marx's discussions, contemporaneous, obviously, discussions of, of communism, right? Because how the destruction of family can be done in a wrong kind of way, which would lead to a common property, bourgeois common property on women, which is sort of already happening, but is wrong. So it's, there is an immediate way in which the opening of the family and opening of the sexual relationship is tied up with the whole idea of communism as an alternative and with the whole idea of what, what's, what's actually going on in now before communism has happened. So thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> That's super helpful, uh, especially since uh, the yeah the Chernyshev chapter is is uh, the one that I I foresee having to do the most work on before I finish the, uh, the dissertation. So <laughs> thank you. Once again, Christy. Uh, thank you all so much. This has been so helpful. <laughs> Thanks, Christy, and see you in two weeks, hopefully.